Hello and welcome back to Classic Books with Star and Lily. And just as a reminder, please stay safe and healthy and subscribe, hit the notification bell, like, and comment below. And I had said that in the last video, because I'm going to do Victor Hugo's Les Mazab, that I was going to try to translate a couple of sentences. The first one was in Spanish, a little bit better than the second translation. Uh, page 129, translated to English from Spanish. I am from Badajoz. Love calls me. All my soul is my eyes because you show your licks. And I think that was something that Thalam, he said, said too. Or I think that was, that's his name. Let me see what his name was. Thalam, yes, I got it. Had, uh, had said to the, uh, the girls and the other three. And then page 138 was French. I was not the best translation, but bear with me. It says, okay, it's on this, this page. Okay. The turkey fathers gave money to an agent so that Monger Clermont Tonier, and his dad was fleeing to St. John. I don't know if I got that right, but hopefully I. But Clermont could not be, because it said he was like a pope, that he was not, could not be, that he, I think he was a priest, not a pope, well, obviously. So their infuriating agent, their reporter, their agent. So, okay. Well, probably not the best translation, but I tried. And we are on book four, which we should finish tonight. Uh, to some Trust is sometimes to surrender. One mother meets another. Subcourted category one. During the first quarter of, of the present century at Montfermeil near Paris, there was a cheap tavern which is no longer there. It was kept by a man and wife named Thenardier in the Ruelle Bollinger. Above the door, nailed flat against the wall, was a board on which something was painted that looked like a man carrying on his back another man wearing the heavy epaulettes of a general, gilded with large silver stars, red blotches signified blood. The rest of the picture was smoke and probably represented a battle. At the base was this inscription, The Sergeant of Waterloo. Nothing is more ordinary than a cart or wagon in front of the door to an inn. Nevertheless, the vehicle, or more properly speaking, the fragment of a vehicle obstructing the street in front of the Sergeant of Waterloo, one evening in the spring of 1818, certainly, by its bulk would have attracted the attention of any pass passing painter. It was the front part of one of those trolleys for carrying heavy tr articles, used in wooded regions for hauling joists and tree trunks. It consisted of a massive iron axle tree with a pivot to which a heavy pole was attached and which was supported by two enormous wheels. The whole thing was squat, crushing, and misshapen. It might have been mistaken for a gigantic gun carriage. The roads had covered the wheels rims, hubs, axle, and the shaft with a coating of hideous yellowish mud and the similar in color to that which cathedrals are sometimes decorated. The wood had disappeared beneath mud and the iron beneath rust. Under the axle tree being a garland of huge chains fit for an imprisoned Goliath. This chain made one think. One of the beams it was used to carry but of mastodons and mammoths it might have harnessed it had a prison look about it, but a cyclopean, superhuman prison, and seemed as if unriveted from some monster. With it, Homer could have bound Paul, Polyphemus or Shakespeare Caliban. Why was this vehicle in this place on the street, first to obstruct the lane, and then to complete its work of rusting? In the old <clears throat> social order, we find a host of institutions like this across our path in the full light of day with no reason for being there. The middle of the chain was hanging close to the ground under the axle and on the ark as on a swinging rope. Two little girls were sitting that evening an exquisite pair, the smaller eighteen months old, in the lap of the larger two and a half years old. A cleverly tied bandana kept them from falling off. A mother seeing this frightened chain had said, Now there's a toy for my children. The, radi the radiant children, attractively dressed, were like two roses twined on the rusty iron with their perfect sparkling eyes and their fresh laughing faces. One was a rosy blonde, the other a brunette, 
their artless faces too delightful surprises. The perfume shed by a flowering shrub nearby seemed that their own breath, the smaller one, had her pretty little stomach bared with a chaste indecency of infancy. Above and around, the delicate head steeped in joy and bathed in light, the gigantic hulk, black with rust and almost frightful with its tangled curves and sharp angles, arched like the mouth of a cave. The mother, whose appearance was somewhat forbidding but touching at this moment, was sitting up on the doorway of the inn, swinging the two children by a long rope, tenderly following them with her eyes for fear of accident. With that animal yet celestial expression peculiar to motherhood, at each swing the hideous lynx let, o let over out a strident noise like an angry cry. The little ones were in ecstasy, the setting sun mixed with joy. And nothing could be more charming than this whim that made of a made of a titten's chair chain a swing for angels. While rocking the children, the mother sang out tune a then popular song Illa fought to sate un Gurrier, singing and watching her children, prevented her from hearing and seeing what was going on in the street. Someone, however, had approached her as she was beginning the first couplet of the song, and suddenly she heard a voice say quite near her, Ma'am, you have two lovely children, madam. A la belle et tendre Imogene, answered the mother, singing on, then she turned her head. A woman was standing in front of her a few steps away. She also had a child in her arms. In addition, she was carrying a large carpet bag, which seemed heavy. This woman's child was the loveliest creature imaginable, a little girl of about of two or three. She could have competed with the other little ones for the most appealing attire. There were ribbons at her shoulders and Valencians lace above the fine lin linen wings on her cap. The folds of her skirt were raised enough to show her plump, white th thighs. She was charmingly rosy and healthful. One wanted to nibble at the pretty little creature's cheeks. We could say nothing of her eyes except that they must have been large and, and had lashes. She was asleep. She was sleeping in the absolutely confident slumber of her age. Mother's arms are, are made of tenderness, and sweet sleep blesses the child who lies within. As for the mother, she seemed poor and said she looked like a working woman intending, her, intending to return to peasant life. She was young and pretty, possibly, but in her clothes, beauty could not show could not show through. Her hair, one blonde mesh of which had slipped loose, seemed very thick, but it was severely fastened up beneath an ugly tight nun's headdress, tied under the chin. Laughing show, shows fine teeth when one has, has them, but she did not laugh. Her eyes seemed not to have been tearless for a long time. She was pale. She looked very weary and somewhat sick. She gazed at her child asleep in her arms with that look peculiar to a mother who nurses her <coughs> own child. Her figure was clumsily masked by a large blue kerchief like those used by invalids folded across her bosom. Her hands were tanned and spotted with freckles, the forefinger hardened and pricked with the needle. She wore a coarse brown wool mantle, a calico dress and heavy shoes. It was Fantine. Yes, Fantine, hard to recognize, yet with a closer look. You could see she still retained her beauty. A sad line, like a touch of irony, had marked her right cheek. As for her clothing, that airy web of muslin and ribbons that seemed made of gaiety, folly, and music, full of baubles and perfume, perfumed with lilacs that had banished like the beautiful sparkles of hoarfrost, which we take for diamonds on the, in the sun, they melt and leave the branch with a dreary black smudge. Ten months had slipped by since the good joke. What had happened during those ten months, we can well imagine. After recklessness comes trouble. Fantine had lost sight of favorite Zephyr and Dahlia, his high broken mother men, loosened for the woman, women. They would have been astonished if anyone had said two weeks later they were friends. They no longer had any reason to be so. Fantine was left alone, the father her, of her child gone. Alas, such partings are irrevocable. She found herself absolutely isolated with the habit of labor lost and the taste for pleasure acquired. Led by her liaison with the Lamis to disdain the simple work she knew how to do, she had neglected her opportunities now they were all gone. 
no resources. Fantine could scarcely read and did not know how to write. She had only been taught in childhood how to sign her name. She had a letter written by a public letter writer to Thalamis, then a second, then a third. Thalamis had replied to none of them. One day Fantine heard some old woman saying, as they saw her child, Do people ever take such children seriously? They only shrugged their shoulders at them. Then she thought of Thalamis, who shrugged his shoulders at his child, and who did not take this innocent creature seriously. And her heart turned dark at the place and that had been his. But what should she do? She had no one to ask. She had made a mistake, but deep down we know she was modest and virtuous. She had a vague feeling of being on the brink of danger, of slipping into the streets. She had to have courage. She had it and continued bravely. She had the idea of returning to her native village, montreal sur mer There perhaps someone would remember her and give her work. Yes, but she would have to hide her mistake, and she had a confused notion of a possibly necessary separation still more painful than the first. Her heart ached, but she made up her mind. We will see that Fantine possessed fierce courage. She had already valiantly given up her finery, was dressed in calico and had put all her silks, her trinkets, her ribbons, and laces on her daughter. The only vanity that remained, and that a sacred one, she sold all she had, which gave her two hundred francs. When her little debts were paid, she had only about eighty left. At eighty-two years of age, on a spring, excuse me, at twenty-two years of age, on a fine spring morning, she left Paris, carrying her child on her back. Anyone seeing the two of them go by would have pitied them. The woman did nothing in the world but it, this child, and this child did nothing in the world but this woman. Fantine had nursed her child that had weakened her chest some, somewhat, and she coughed slightly. We shall have no, shall have no further need to speak of M. Felix Thalamides. Let me sneeze in a minute. We will only say that 20 years later, under King Louis the Philip, he was a, a fat... <laughs> Excuse me. He was a fat provincial attorney, rich and influential, a wise voter and rigid juror, but as always a man of pleasure. Toward noon, after having, for the sake of her health, traveled from time to time at a cost of a penny a mile in what they then called the petites voitures of the outskirts of Paris, Fantine reached Montfermeil and stood in the Ruelle Bollinger. As she was passing by the then Artier in the two little children happily perched on their monstrous swing had a dazzling effect upon her, and she paused before this vision of joy. Magic charms do exist. These two little girls were one for this mother. Brimming with emotion, she watched them. The presence of angels is a herald of paradise. She thought she saw above this inn, the mysterious hair of providence, these children were so clearly happy she gazed at them, admired them, so much affected that as the mother was taken a breath between verses of her song, she could not help saying what we have just read. You have two lovely children there, ma madam. The most ferocious animals are disarmed by caresses to their young. The mother raised her head and thanked her and made the stranger sat down on the stone step. She herself being in the doorway, the two women began to talk. My name is Madame Thenardier, said the mother of the two girls. We run this inn. Then going on with her song, she sang between her teeth. Il la fought Jesus Cavalier et jar pour la Palestine. This Madame Thenardier was a red-headed, large but angular woman. The soldier's wife type in all its horror was strangely, uh, was strangely enough a languid air gained from novel reading. She was unrefined but simpering. Old romances impressed on the imagination of mistresses of restaurants have such effects. She was still young, scarcely thirty. If this woman now seated bent over had been upright, perhaps but her towering form and broad shoulders, those of a movable colossus, fit for a market woman, would have dismayed the traveler, disturbed her confidence, and prevented what we have to tell, a person seated instead of standing. Fate hangs on such just, just such a thread. 
The traveler told her story, somewhat modified. She said she was a working woman and her husband was dead. Unable to find a job in Paris, she was going to search for it elsewhere. In her own province, she had left Paris that morning on foot. Carrying her child, she had become tired, and meeting the Villemomble stage had gotten in from Villemomble. She had come on foot to Montfermeil. The child had walked a little, but not much. She was so young, she had had to carry her, and the jewel had fallen asleep. And at these words, she gave her daughter a passionate kiss, which wakened her. The child opened her large eyes, blue like her mother's, and saw what, what, nothing, everything, with that serious, sometimes severe look of little children, which is one of the mis mysteries of their shining innocence before our shadowy virtues. It is though they felt themselves angels and knew us to be human. Then the child begins, began to laugh, and although the mother held her back, she slipped to the ground with the indomitable energy of a little one that wants to run around. All at once she caught sight of the two others in their swing, stopped short, and put out her tongue in, t in token of admiration. Mother Thenardier untied the children and took them off the swing, saying, Play together, three of you. At that age, acquaintance is easy, and in a moment the little Thenardiers were playing with the newcomer, digging holes in the ground to their intense delight. This newcomer was very cheerful. The goodness of the mother is written in the gaiety of the child. She had taken a small piece of wood, which she used as a spade, and was energetically digging a hole fit for a fly. The grave digger's work, work is fun when done by a child. The two women went on chatting. What's her name? Cosette. For Cosette read, Euphrasy, the name of the little one was Euphrasy, but the mother had made, made Cosette out of it by that sweet and charming instinct of mothers and of the people who change Josepha into Pepita and Francois into Celette. It is kind of derivation that confuses and disconcerts. It is a kind of derivation that confuses and disconcerts the entire science of etymology. We knew a grandmother who succeeded in changing Theodore to non, I think it's non, G-N-O-N. How old is she? Going on three years, the same age as my first. The three girls were grouped in an attitude of profound anxiety and bliss. A great event had occurred. A large worm had come out of the ground. They were both afraid of it and in ecstasies over it. Their bright foreheads touched three heads in one halo of glory. Children, exclaimed the Thenardier woman and mother. How quickly they get to know one another. Look at them. One would swear they were three sisters. These words with the spark of their, of the other mother was probably waiting. She seized the hand of Madame Thenardier, looked right at her and said, Will you keep my child for me? I wouldn't blame. Madame Thenardier made a gesture of surprise, neither consent nor refusal. Cassette's mother went on. You see, I can't take my child into the country. The work will prevent it. With a child, I couldn't find a job there. They're so backward. They're so backward in that district. It was the good Lord who led me to your inn. The sight, the sight of your little ones, so pretty and clean and happy, immediately overwhelmed me. I said, "There's a good mother. They will be like three sisters, and then it will not be long before I come back. Will you keep my child to me? I must think it over," Madame Thenardier said. I will give six francs a month. Here's a man's voice. Was here a man's voice was heard from within. Not less than seven francs and six months paid in advance. Six times seven is forty-two. The woman said. The wife said, "I'll pay it," said the mother. And fifteen francs extra for the first expenses added the man. That's fifty-seven francs, Madame the Thenardier said. And in the midst of her reckoning. She sang indistinctly, Il a fought the saint un -gurier. I'll pay it, said the mother. I have eighty francs. That, that will leave me enough to reach my part of the country if I walk. I'll earn some money there, and as soon as I have some, I will come for my little love. The man's voice responded, Does the child have clothes? That is my husband, said Madame Thenardier. Of course she has, the poor darling. I could tell it was your husband, and a fine wardrobe, too, an extravagant wardrobe. Everything in dozens, and silk dresses like a lady's. They are in my carrying bag. You have to leave that here, put, 
in the man's voice. Of course I'll give it to you, said the mother. It would be odd if I left my child naked. The face of the master appeared. All right, she said. The bargain was concluded. The mother spent the night at the inn, gave her money, and left her child and packed her bag, much lighter now, minus her child's clothes, and set off the next morning, expecting to return soon. These partings, soon, these partings appear tranquil, but are full of despair. A neighbor of the Thenardiers met this mother on the street after she had left her child, and she came in saying, I'll, I have just met a woman in the street who was crying as if her heart would break. When Cosette's mother had gone, the man said to his wife, that's enough for my debt of a hundred and ten francs, which falls due tomorrow. I was fifty francs short. Do you realize a sheriff would have come and they'd have brought charges against me? You built a good mouse trap with your little ones. Without even knowing it, the woman said. Subcategory two. First sketch of two equivocal faces. The captured mouse was very puny, but the cat, cat exults even over a lean mouse. What were the Thenardiers like? We will say just a word right here. Later the sketch will be completed. They belong to that bastard class composed of rough people who have risen, risen, intelligent people who have fallen, which lies between the so-called middle and lower classes and unites some of the faults of the latter with nearly all the vices of the former, without possessing the generous impulses of the worker or the respectability of the bourgeois. They were among those dwarfish natures which, if they happened to be heated by some sullen fire, easily become monstrous. The woman was at heart a brute, the man a blackguard, both in the highest degree capable of that hideous sort of progression that can be made toward evil. There are souls that, crab-like, <clears throat> crawl continually toward darkness, going backward in life rather than advancing, using their experience to increase their deformity, growing continually worse and becoming steeped more and more thoroughly in intensifying viciousness. That was the case with this man and this woman. The man especially would not have been a puzzle to a physiognomist. We have only to look at some men to distrust them, for we feel this darkness of their souls in two directions. They are restless as to what is behind them and threatening as to what is in front of them. They are full of mystery. We can answer no more for what they have done than for what they will do. The shadows in their eyes give them away. Hearing them utter a single word or seeing them make one gesture, we catch glimpses of guilty secrets in their past and dark mysteries in their future. This Thenardier, if we can believe him, had been a soldier. A sergeant, he said. He probably had been in the campaign of 1815 and had even been brave, it seems. Later we shall see what his bravery consisted of. The sign of his inn was an allusion to one of his feats, to one of his feats of arms. He had painted himself, for he knew how to do a little of everything, all badly. Donald Trump. It was the time when the old classic romance, which after being Valil, sank to Lodoiska, still noble, but becoming more and more vulgar, Falling from Mademoiselle de Scuderia to, to Madame Barthelemy Hadot, and from Madame de Lafayette to Madame Bonan Malarme, was inflaming the romantic souls of the concierges of Paris and causing some devastation even in the suburbs. Madame Thenardier was just intelligent enough to read such books. She fed on them, she drowned what little brain she had in them, and they had given her what, while she was still young, and even later kind of pensive attitude toward her husband, a genuine villain, a ruffian educated almost to the point of grammar, at once coarse and fine, but so far as sentimentality was concerned, reading Pigault Lebrun, and for all related to the weaker sex, as he put it, a totally correct dolt. His wife was about 12 or 15 years younger than he. At a later period, when limp romantic locks <coughs> began to gray when McGarry parted company with Pamela. Madame Thenardier was only a gross, mean woman who had relished stupid novels. People do not read stupidities with impunity. The result was that her eldest child was named Epony, and the youngest, who had just escaped being called Galnaire, owed to some chance pleasure wrought by a novel by Ducray Domino, the least, last problematic 
no, excuse me, the less problematic name of Azelma. However, let us say in passing that all things are not ridiculous and superficial in the singular era to which we are alluding, and which might be termed the anarchy of baptismal names. Besides this romantic element we have just noted, there is the social symptom. Today it is not infrequently that we see shepherds named Arthur, Alfred, and Alphonse, and Viscounts, if Viscounts still exist, named Thomas, Peter, or James. This change, which placed the elegant name on the plebeian and the country appellation on the aristocrat, is only an eddy in the tide of equality. Ir irresistible penetration of new inspiration is there, as in everything else. Beneath this apparent discord, there is a great and profound reality, the French Revolution. Subcategory 3, and this is be the end. The Lark. To be vicious does not ensure prosperity. The inn, in fact, was not doing well. Thanks to Fantine's 57 francs, Thenardier had been able to avoid a lawsuit in honor of signature. The month, next month, they were still in need of money, and the woman carried Cosette's wardrobe to Paris and pawned it for 60 francs. When this sum was spent, the Thenardiers began to look on the little girl as a child they sheltered for charity and treated her accordingly. Her clothes were gone. They dressed her in the cast-off skirts and blouses of the little Thenardiers, that is, in rags. They fed her on everyone's leftovers, a little better than the dog, but a little worse than the cat. Well, you know, cats are awesome, but children should be fed better. <laughs> the dog and cat were her mess messmates. Cosette ate with them under the table off a wooden dish like theirs. Her mother, who, as sh we shall later see, had found a job at Montreal, Surmer, wrote, or rather had someone write for her every month, asking for news of her child. The Thenardiers invariably replied, Cosette is doing wonderfully well. The six months passed. The mother sent seven francs for the seven, seventh month and continued to send this sum, sum regularly month after month. The year was not over, be for Thenardiers said, it's not enough. What does she expect us to do for, to do for her for her seven francs? And as he and he wrote, demanding twelve francs, the mother persuaded that her child was happy and doing well. Agreed and forwarded the twelve francs. There are certain new natures that cannot have love on one side without hatred on the other. Madame Thenardier passionately loved her own little ones and therefore detested the younger stranger. It is sad to realize that a mother's love can have such a dark side. Little as was the place Cosette's, Cosette occupied in the house, it seemed to her that this little was taken from her children and that Cosette decreased the air her girls breathed. This woman, like many of her kind, had a certain amount of caresses and a certain amount of blows and hard words to dispense each day. When she had not had Cosette, surely her daughters, idolized as they were, would have received it all, but the little stranger did them the service of attracting the blows herself to herself. The children, only the caresses, Cosette could not stir without drawing down on herself a hailstorm of, un storm of undeserved and severe chastisements, a frail, gentle little one who must not have understood anything of this world or of God continually ill-treated, scolded, punished, beaten. She saw beside her two other young things like herself who lived in a halo of glory. The woman was unkind to Cassette, and Epinine and Azelma were unkind too. Children at that age are simply copies of the mother, only the size is reduced. A year passed and then another. People in the village said, what good folks th those Thenardiers are. They are not rich, and yet they bring up a poor, abandoned child. They thought Cosette was forgotten by her mother. Meanwhile, Thenardier, having learned in some obscure way that the child was probably illegitimate and that her mother could not acknowledge her, demanded 15 francs a month, saying that the creature was growing and eating and threatening to send her away. She won't get around me, he exclaimed. I'll drop the brat right down in her hideout. I have to have more money. The mother paid the 15 francs. From year to year, the child grew in a misery, too. So long as Cosette was very small, she was the scapegoat of the two other children. As soon as she began to grow a little, that is to say, before she was five years old, she became the servant of the house. 
five years old. It will be said that's hard to believe, but it's true. Social suffering can begin at any age. Didn't we see recently the trial of Damallard, an orphan named, named turned bandit, who from the age of five say the official documents being alone in the world worked for his living and stole. Cassette was made to run errands, sweep the rooms, the yard, the street, wash the dishes, and even carry heavy loads. The Thenardias felt doubly authorized to treat her this way as the mother, who still remained at Montreal's Surmer, began to be remiss in her payments. Some months remained due. Had this mother returned to Mont Fermil at the end of the, these three years, she would not have known her child. Cosette, so fresh and pretty when she came to that house, was now thin and pale. She had a peculiarly restless air, a sneak, said the Thenardiers. Injustice had made her sullen and misery had made her ugly. Only her eyes remained beautiful, and they were painful to look at, because large as they were, they seemed to increase the sadness. It was harrowing to see the poor child in the winter, not yet six years old, shivering under the tatters of what was once a calico dress, sweeping the street before daylight with an enormous broom in her little red hands and tears in her large eyes. In the neighborhood, she was called the Lark. People like figurative names were happy to give a nickname to this child, no larger than a bird, trembling, frightened, and shivering, first awake every morning in the house and the village always in the streets or in the fields before dawn, except that the poor lark never sang. And that's the end of book four. And, well, book five, we will get into the next. We actually, in the next video, we will summarize books one through four. But if you enjoyed this video, please hit like, subscribe, and comment below. And also stay tuned for more from Victor Hugo's Les Miserables from Astara and Lily. And as always, stay safe and healthy. The like button, subscribe, comment below, hit that notification bell.